first reading this morning is from the book of Psalms. Make known to me your ways, ageless God. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Remember your maternal love, O womb of life, and your faithful love, for they have been from of old. The sins of my youth and my transgressions remember not. According to your faithful love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, gracious one. Good and upright is the fount of wisdom. Therefore, she instructs sinners in the way. She guides the humble in what is just and teaches the humble her way. All the paths of the wisdom of the ages are faithful and true for those who keep her covenant and her decrees. For your name's sake, loving God, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that revere the Holy One of old? She will teach them the way that they should choose. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. Now Jesus went out again beside the sea, and the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then, as Jesus reclined to eat at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also reclining to eat with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, when the biblical scholars among the Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, the women and men who are well have no need of a physician. Rather, those who are sick do. Not to call the righteous have I come, but rather sinners. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations on each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It would seem that the title over this week's gospel lesson would be Jesus, be careful of the company you keep. In this week's scripture lesson, it is not only what Jesus teaches, but how he teaches it that provokes a challenge. Jesus calls Levi to follow him. And Levi has never listened to or chosen to follow Jesus. Levi's profession sets him in opposition to the religious leadership of Roman-occupied Palestine. He is found, most likely, sitting in one of the tax toll booths located along main highways or at bridges and waterways where customs were collected for the regime of Herod Antipas, a client king, a puppet king, serving at the pleasure of the Roman Empire. In this story, Jesus invites a non-debatable sinner to follow him. Because Luke, or Levi, sorry, Levi has two strikes against him. He is ritually unclean because he interacts with Gentiles and deals in Gentile money. And he is a collaborator with Rome 
and therefore considered a traitor to his own people. Most tax and custom collectors were known to take a cut of the taxes that they collected, profiting from the oppressive taxation of Rome. Yet, Jesus reaches out and pulls this man, Levi, into the community of his disciples. And Levi, in turn, leaves everything to follow Jesus. In the scripture lesson, Mark uses the power of repetition to hammer home to his listeners by saying it three times that the company Jesus keeps is tax collectors and sinners. And after calling Levi, we find that Jesus is reclining at table in Levi's house so that this was no quick drop-in visit to check on him and see how he's doing. He's there to stay a while. By reclining at table, we might consider this a setting like a Roman banquet where guests reclined around a central table. Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? The practice of the Pharisees, the separated ones, was to stay clear of contagion, uncleanness, contamination, in order to maintain their righteousness. By contrast, what Jesus is doing here is to associate directly with that contagion, that uncleanness, dining with tax collectors and sinners. There is some insecurity in the human spirit that desires and needs rules, certainty, control, principles to live by. And avoiding ambiguity and paradox in the scriptures and in religion enables us to feel comfortable in our beliefs and to have a clear sense of this is right and that is wrong. Jesus' response, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. At Levi's home, Jesus is not revising the ancient purity laws. Jesus is defying them as they have been traditionally practiced. In the realm of God that he is here to announce and to model for us, Jesus wants us to understand that God's table will feed all who hunger regardless of class, religious identity, or purity status. This scripture passage is significant to us and to Levi for two reasons. First, Levi is individually accepted by God. And then second, the wider implication that all people who are religiously and socially marginalized are accepted by God. Specifically in this lesson, what Jesus is teaching is that those who want to be insiders in Jesus' group must envision themselves reclining next to the people whose politics and behavior they may find disgusting and then eating out of the same dish with them. Jesus gladly shares a meal with Levi Levi's friends and Levi's colleagues. Levi's dinner table is an inclusive one. It is not only for the privileged members group, but it is open for the whole community. Around that table, God's grace and mercy are being offered even to tax collectors and sinners who are often in the scriptures grouped together with beggars, thieves, murderers, sexually immoral people, and Gentiles. This inclusive dinner party was filled with the joyful sounds of laughter and boisterous noise. For Jesus, there are no boundaries between insiders and outsiders. God's grace and mercy are not limited to insiders who are righteous, but is also extended to outsiders, 
marginalized as sinners by society. By crossing boundaries, Jesus reveals the presence and work of God's spirit who makes the whole human community whole. Jesus is our epiphany. His example of table fellowship reveals a God who welcomes all of us without reference to our social status, where we were born, who our parents are, our physical appearance, how many degrees we hold, how much money we make, what we have accomplished in life, how old or healthy we are. These are not the criteria for receiving God's interest and compassion. All of us are welcome at God's table, and so is everybody else. To live into that spirit of divine compassion actively challenges social structures that impede the realization of anyone's full humanity. It is precisely the scribes, the biblical scholars among the Pharisees, those that were socially defined and self-proclaimed righteous ones who are most in need of Jesus' message. Yet they were the least able to hear it. For them, Jesus was a threat. He was disturbing their ease and comfortable status quo. Jesus' message of liberation resonated with the despised and vulnerable ones the poor and dispossessed who flocked to Jesus and his message of divine compassion. The Reverend Al Masters, in discussing this passage, comments that a fundamental problem for Old Testament prophets as well as contemporary believers is that people do religion or do church as a substitute for doing justice and mercy. Jesus did not call and invite people who thought that they were righteous, but people who knew they needed God. And just as Jesus' call of Levi and his eating and associated with tax collectors and sinners created tension and challenge for the biblical scholars and religious establishment of his day, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrate with a national holiday tomorrow, did the same for the United States of America. It was not enough for him to use his pulpit for this purpose of saving souls, but the call of the prophets, as well as the gospel, to authentic justice for all people was a primary focus of his life and ministry. That call for the living out of authentic justice meant not just revising the Jim Crow laws that dominated the South, but defying them as necessary. Whether the issue was a seat on a bus wherever one chose to sit, or the right to vote as a citizen of the country is entitled to do, or the right to use any public water fountain, swimming pool, bathroom, lunch counter, unmolested and without danger of physical harm or being lynched, Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that he helped found worked tirelessly to improve the lives of America's black citizens. Dr. King called on America to live up to the principles enunciated in our Declaration of Independence, that all men, all men, women and children, regardless of the color of their skin, were created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. He reminded everyone, from the president, Congress, senators, down to ordinary citizens, that America had not yet lived up to that potential. In fact, he reminded us America was failing its black and brown citizens, and he was reviled for it. Dr. King also called the church to account for its silence. 
Many of us know of his letter from Birmingham jail that he penned in April 1963. That may be his most well-known call to America's clergy, but I found a speech he gave to a conference of religious leaders in May 1959 to be as compelling, and a call to the wider church also to get involved. Dr. King was invited by then Vice President Richard Nixon to discuss how religious leaders might support President Eisenhower's Committee on Government Contracts in advancing its program of elimination of discrimination and employment in government contracts. Some of us may be uncomfortable when the church becomes involved in public policy discussions. Dr. King, however, was not asking for his own or his National Baptist denomination's beliefs to be written into the laws of the land. Rather, he looked at the problem of discrimination as not merely a political issue, but a profound moral issue. Dr. King regarded the church as the guardian of the morals of the community. And here is where I find his views cogent, even in 2024. He said, a religion true to its nature must always be concerned about man's social conditions. Religion operates not only on the vertical plane, but also on the horizontal. It seeks not only to integrate humanity with God, but to integrate humanity with to integrate humanity with each other and each person with themselves. This means that at bottom, true religion is a two-way road. On the one hand, it seeks to change the souls of humanity and thereby unite them with God. On the other hand, it seeks to change the environmental conditions of humanity so that the soul will have a chance after it is changed. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually moribund religion in need of new blood. He continued, therefore, this becomes a grave challenge to the church and to clergy and laypersons alike. To meet that challenge, all churches must accept the obligation to create the moral climate in which, in this case, he was speaking about fair employment practices, but today might we not also add voting rights, the rights of women to make choices for their own health and the rights of LGBTQ persons that they are viewed positively and accepted willingly. We must utilize, he said, the vast resources of the churches and synagogues for the many educational functions they can employ and for which they have highly developed skills, facilities, and experience. However, to possess those resources is worthless without the will to be effective. The time has come, Dr. King said, when the churches are needed by their people and their nation as never before. They uniquely can break the deadening silence which engulfs the well-meaning white people of the South and today we might say of America. Dr. King's words are as timely in January 2024 as they were in May 1959 when he spoke them. Look up his speech. Look up all that he has to say. Toward the end of the speech that he gave, he said, we have reason to believe that because of the shape of the world today, we cannot afford the luxury of an anemic democracy. Speaking to the gathered clergy in the room, he called them to work assiduously and with determined boldness 
to remove from the body politic the cancerous disease of discrimination, which is preventing our democratic and Christian health from being realized. Friends, we are called by Jesus himself to give up our socially constructed security and to go in search of others who are in need. Jesus demonstrated a wide welcome and authentic love for all people as he reclined at the table in Levi's home. Dr. King challenged us to make that dream of American democracy a reality, that all were equal, all were deserved at the table, and his dream remains unfulfilled. In closing, I will quote what he called his dream in that speech, a dream of equality of opportunity, of privilege and property widely distributed, a dream of a land where men will not take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, a dream of a land where men do not argue that, do not argue that the color of a man's skin determines the content of his character, where they recognize that the basic thing about a person is not their specificity, but their fundamentum. A dream of a place where all our gifts and resources are held, not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service for the rest of humanity. The dream of a country where every person will respect the dignity and worth of all human personality. And humans, humans will dare to live together as siblings. That is the dream. Whenever it is fulfilled, he concluded, we will emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glowing daybreak of freedom and justice for all of God's children. Beware the company we keep. May we make trouble. May we make good trouble. Amen.